Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody to my talk. Uh, so the outline of the talk will be as follows. I'll give a short motivation, kind of recapping what Neil said last year uh, about why we went to this project. Then I'll talk about the design of the project itself, how we actually implemented it. And then I'll go through some uh, experiences we learned from production, hopefully maybe giving you some lessons, what you could maybe avoid, and some future plans. Firstly, to introduce myself, my name is Ivan Budinchevich, you pronounce it very well, and I'm actually, uh, uh, my background is I have a PhD in nuclear physics, so it's, it's kind of in line with the previous talk. I also come from a scientific background, but uh, in my scientific background, I realized that I really like fiddling with codes and you know, data analysis with Python, so I thought, man, I want to go to IT because it's fun, because I can play with stuff. So that's where I went to Ball.com in the Netherlands, and I've been there a Java developer since 2016. And I think also because of my background, I kind of liked working with data and I went to big data technologies because I can still fiddle with data, look at a lot of pretty graphs and do stuff. So uh, motivation behind the project is we are Ball.com. We're uh, the biggest online retailer in the Netherlands and in the Flemish part of Belgium. Still, I'm not really sure what the strategy is for just keeping ourselves tied down to two markets, but okay. And we started with uh, selling only books at the webshop. But now we basically brought out and we sell everything, including the kitchen sink. I don't know if you know that joke. Anyway, uh, we <laughs> yeah, it's an old joke I heard from Bugs Bunny. I want to use it. So basically, we have 15 million products in our catalog uh, uh, currently on sale. We have 50 million in total. We have more than 5 million active customers, 6 million, sorry, a lot of uh, almost 30 million visits per month, 6 billion. Uh, 4 billion page views per year. So a lot of a lot of things happening, and we need to handle this with Hadoop. And we have a lot of technologies from the Hadoop stack, and as you can see, as I hope you can see on my laptop, I have stickers from Flink and Kafka, and I'm really happy to have finally you know, embraced my inner hipster by being a developer with a Mac and two stickers in Berlin. <laughs> so <laughs> we use this stack. And basically, one of the things we use the Hadoop stack for is that we want to make uh, recommendations. But some of the limitations we currently have are that we use batching and we have uh, things that run once per day. So for example, our search suggestions, yeah, I, I'm guessing the focus is not good, but these are, this is basically our website and you have somebody typing in dark and I get like things like dark souls here. And basically we get these things from uh, batch jobs once a day. And this is a limitation we want to get over. And another thing we do is we show personal recommendations based on customer histories. So here you see an example, Yebeke can all interesting, like, you know, things you saw, things that might also be interesting are some purple pillows for me, and that's because I bought a Dragon Ball when I was in Japan, and I want to buy a purple mat for it, like Goku has. I haven't found it on our website, but uh, I'll find it. And basically, these are the types of things that we like to do for customers. We like to see what the customer likes, what they're trying to find, and personalize it. And ideally, we would like to do this in real time. We want to be able to handle these yeah, customer needs in real time. This was the key motivation for our uh, framework that, uh, called Measurement.20. So as I said, real time. That's the key that we want to uh, address, so not having batches once a day. And we want to measure everything. So we want to measure everything the customer has done, everything that he has seen, or I mean, sorry, that they have done, that they have seen. Uh, and uh, yeah, anyway, we want to see all of that. So basically, uh, this led to the design of measurement 2.0. We are measuring everything, all Ajax, uh, asynchronous things, uh, all the channels that we have. We have a web shop, but we also send emails to people. We have seller dashboards. So you basically want to measure everything across the whole ball landscape. And we want to have reliable data. We want to have lowest possible loads on the clients, lowest possible latencies. We also want to be, so since this is an in-house solution, which we've made because we were not satisfied with the other solutions that were available at the time, uh, this is an in-house solution that is, that the key is for it to be embedded in our landscape and for our developers to use it. So we want them to be able to use it easily and to validate things easily, to test them easily. So we're constantly working with them to getting feedback on if they like it or not, things we should change or not. And we also need to have uh, good business flexibility because we want to be able to measure everything. But we're also aware that we might have not thought of everything so that we also want to be able to extend all the measurements, to ask new questions. Now, and the final thing is that we also want to handle some perhaps sensitive things like privacy. Uh, there's uh, Act, things like that people cannot be tracked on a personal level longer than two years. Some 
yeah, the Netherlands like their rules, so these are one of the rules we have to follow. And security things that we also, of course, have to be safe against hackers and that we can do profiling. Now, uh, going into the design of the actual framework, uh, what, how we did it is that we have the web shop, the mobile.com, and basically when this web shop renders a page, we generate the measurements. We generate the measurements, and this measurement is sent into Kafka. And at the moment of generating the measurements, this is the moment where we render the page, we also generate some tags, tags that we insert in the HTML, and these tags are basically the IDs of that measurement, of that event, and this ID can be used for in-view measurements, for things like if a customer scrolled down and then something came in another view or they clicked on it, we can use this to identify that they've clicked on a particular part of the page, and that can be seen by our web service that generates a sort of a so-called front-end measurement. Uh, and puts it back into Kafka. The key being that this ID is the same here and here, and from the back end and the front end, so we can merge the two later. Uh, the measurements are then sent from Kafka to the Flink jobs, and I think it's interesting to point out that the moment the generates are made until they get to Kafka, it takes like five milliseconds, so there's, we can really, ideally, really do stuff really real, real, real time. And we can uh, do some processing on these Kafka streams, Flink jobs, which we output to HDFS, Kafka, or Cassandra, depending on where we're using the measurements at. Now, this is an example of a page, which we call the Winkelwagen, like the shopping basket. And this I will use to tell you about the data structure of our measurements. So if you look at this page, yeah, yeah don't mind that it's horribly defocused, but it's like the, the point is that we have the page and we have some uh, components. So the red component is basically the entire page. This is something that, co it's a container and it contains things that are in there. Uh, we have groups, which are in blue, which are things that we can, we can put metadata in there, like why are all these things in blue? What, what, what binds them together? Here there are two items in a basket, shopping basket, and green are specific items, like a product. And uh, the hook is this, basically anything that a customer can interact with, that something happens, that's a hook. And what happens when a customer clicks on a hook, let's say a customer clicked on the, this picture, pointed in purple, they will get a URL, and in the URL, we will attach an extra query parameter, which is an ID that I just mentioned before, is an ID for this measurement. Now, cu the customer will then go onto a different page, but we will know from this hook that they came from the previous page. And then we can relate that to this container on this new page. And then if on, within this page, they click on a different item within this group or within this item, they go to another page, we still have this link. So basically, this will also have the same, this is a list page with a list of different products, and the customer here, we will have the whole track from the beginning, when they were in the shopping, shopping basket, to the product page, where they were on the product, to the list page in the end, or, I mean, obviously they can have much longer journeys, but this demonstrates the principle that we can follow their entire path. Now, moving on to the actual experience we had in production, which uh, I'm hoping you were wanting to hear, uh, these are some of the measurements we gained, and this is a typical day of measurements. This is 0 to 24 hours, uh, starting at 6 in the morning, ending at 6, put some key times here. And these are number of measurements generated per minute. Now, I like this pattern because this pattern ha happens every day, and it has some characteristic things. For example, it has the sandwich dip, because the Dutch people only eat sandwiches for lunch, which is really frustrating as a Serbian used to barbecues. <laughs> and then they have an after-lunch peak, and then, you know, go home for dinner, have some potatoes, it's potato dip. <laughs> and then there's the classic evening peak, where we get most of our key traffic. Now, sometimes there are also things happening in the middle of the night, which are most likely bots. And then this is something I like as a kind of a, a side side thing that happened, there was a period in April we had days with a lot of spiky behavior. We couldn't really figure out what it was. Then we talked to the security guys and we figured out it was basically coming from a bot network from somewhere in the US. And by filtering out this network, we just managed to you know, stabilize our site, have less bots and things. But this is, a, I think, a nice example of something that the system was not exactly designed to do, but it's a new question that was answered just because of the system being there. Now, this is our some other little numbers and things that we have currently having 15,000 measure, 15, measurements per minute. This is still not 
this is really important to say here that we are only measuring fully the shopping page, uh, the shopping basket page, the Winkelwagen that I showed you before. And this is because we are now in the process with our developers to actually tag every single type of page in the web shop. So we're also using this as a learning thing to improve the system, but also it's not, not fully there yet. And uh, we are expecting at peak time when everything is tagged to have around 6 million measurements per minute. But, you know, some things we can already show is that pages are like, like the product page, like this on this pie chart in blue, are the most visited, which we were expecting anyway, but it's nice to be able to show it specifically. Now, some things, uh, there's a lesson that we would, like to teach, uh, we would like to share with you from Kafka, is that we are one of the first users at Ball.com which are using Kafka. And uh, so these are some of the specs of our cluster. And one problem we had was that in the beginning, when we were setting everything up and really running things in production, we saw that there was one disk that spent a lot of time on I.O. operations. It was com constantly getting stuck on this. We couldn't figure out why. And then finally, we saw that there was a property in Kafka called flush messages, which was set to zero. This means that they will constantly try to save stuff to disk. And when I was doing this with uh, Yelev and the our CRT guy, uh, I like to call him J-Dog. If you ever meet him, call him J-Dog. He hates it. It's a nickname. I want to make it a thing. So we saw that there is this, that this property. If you look into the Kafka actual settings, it says, in general, we recommend you not set this. So our lesson was, don't change the default property unless you know what you're doing. Because we had no idea what we were doing. Yella said, I am Martin did that, you know, when he was setting it up. Like, okay. So this is something that we just learned. And... Uh, uh, an actual application of the measurements. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, man, I was going way too fast. Okay. Uh, cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll try to come up with a few jokes or something along the way. So, so basically, uh, this is, it's really cool to have this measuring infrastructure to be able to measure everything. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you want to use it for something, right? So, uh, one, this is one of the first applications that we uh, came up with is, if you remember in the beginning of the talk, I talked about the search recommendations and how we do this. We have batches that run once every 24 hours. So the trending uh, products at our website, unfortunately, still run t once every 24 hours, and they actually compute the previous day. So, you know, if you're seeing something trending on bulb.com, it's actually really not trending anymore. <laughs> So yeah, we were a few days late with the fidget spinners as well. So uh, one thing, we, so this real-time trending product does is that we actually look at our measurements that we are creating and sending into Kafka. Uh, I'll, I'll show you slightly more details on how we do it, but we can do it now in real time and calculate uh, with specific configuration parameters we can change. But for example, we now calculate for the last 10 minutes what was trending compared to a, previous of a period of the previous four hours. And you can see that this is a set of things that was like a sunscreen, a, a, a pool, and an air conditioner, which was happening on the day when it was one of those rare sunny days in the Netherlands when people had wanted to actually buy sunscreen. And there was also like a movie, but you know, I guess not everybody wanted to go out. And you can see here, actually, I think a nice example of uh, our measurements showing behavior in the data. Uh, which relates to trending. So this is, this is a graph of, uh, this is the times of day, and this is like 7 o'clock, this is 7.30, the rest you don't really need to know at the moment. <laughs> it's, it's other hours. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, the, and the y axis is number of search results for a given term. And there is a, a TV show in the Netherlands called The Veral Raidor, Dreidor, I think, uh, which basically goes on every day and talks about popular stuff, pe what people are looking at, and it also has a segment, Books of the Month. And on this particular day, uh, I think this was in March, they had these four books that they mentioned at 7.10 or so, 7.15, and then you saw that by 7.30, these books were already trending on our website. And this is directly coming from our data, and this was... Okay, at the time, the whole the, uh, trending products thing was not finished, but if it was finished, then these books will already be live in the trending products. They are live now on production behind an A-B test. So things like this we will pick up. And how do we do it? This is a very simplified uh, picture of um, our Flink. 
I didn't want to show the whole Flink dashboard because it's way too much detail, but this shows you just the principle of what we do is we have our measurements coming from Kafka. They go through certain filters, like people not looking at the same uh, page, you know, five, 20 times, or bots, people trying to push their own products, making them trending, so things like this. We're filtering out in this moment. Then we're counting how many pages were seen, uh, calculating the z-scores, which is basically how much uh, the views for a given product are deviating and how many standard deviation from the mean of the historical periods, and then outputting our results, which is basically just a little file with 20 or whatever amount of z-scores we want, outputting is HDFS and Cassandra and serving it back to our web shop so that we can show it. And finally, uh, this is just uh, a note that I want to share with uh, how we are storing our files is that we're using writing schemas in Avro because it's, it's a very nice uh, schema language. It can generate Java classes, supports schema evolution, and also storing them in Parquet uh, because, yeah, uh, Parquet is, uh, you, most of you have probably heard of it, but you know, it's a col columnar storage format and it's good for read cases where you need to read quickly from Parquet. And some, yeah, and so we also, contributed a bit, uh, Niels Vaches, who actually designed the measuring 2.0 system, contributed to Avro with the schema evolution system by making a new message type format that it was used there. And finally, uh, just the future plans. So these were, so far I, I showed you what we did in the first six months. And the next step is we are currently busy with tagging the entire web shop. As I said, we were only tagging the basket page. We are now going with our developers, with the other teams, just, you know, what went wrong here? Can we can we tag this page and that page, and then we see that something completely doesn't work, you know, and then we fix it. So, a regular process. And then uh, we also want to tag the mobile app uh, because this is not currently tagged yet. Customers who do look at the website through the mobile, through their phone browsers, they are measured, but if they're using the app itself, they are not yet. And we also want to fully enable in-view measurements. I didn't mention this, but we are currently trying to. Ena actually, we enabled them last week, I think, for 25%. So 25% of customers were also generating things they actually saw, if they moved in and out of frame, how many things were in frame, which is something we could not have done before with uh, Omniture or something like this. And we're also, in the end, as I said, we really want people to use our data, so we're going to provide tooling as well for business analysts to look at it and generate, for example, live reports, perhaps, and many other... Uh, many other things. And finally, I want to thank you for your attention. And yeah, just uh, this is sort of a mini plug, but uh, I'm from Bold.com, and we had like a, a first Spaces Summit conference. Don't mind that I'm sweaty, and this looks a bit nasty, but uh, we had this last week on Friday, and we're kind of hoping to make it a thing. So I'm just promoting it here. It was an in-company in conference for other, because we have 300 developers. We are also hiring, by the way, if you want to join. And yeah, we're hoping maybe this one might, might become a thing later on. And thank you for your attention. This is the end.